So let's get going. Uh, maybe we'll start with a couple of quick introductions. Um, I'm Alan Percy. I'm the vice president, uh, one of the vice presidents for the council, and uh, also the program co-chair for Birchbark Expeditions, and, and um, thrilled to have you here. Also is Han Hank Stapinski. So Hank, you want to say hi real quick? Hello, everyone. Hank Stapinski, been a longtime scouter here, former scoutmaster at uh, Troop 92 up in Swarmsville, and uh, happy to be with you tonight. Yep. Great, great. Thanks for joining me, Hank. And, and Hank and I are going to kind of go back and forth on the presentation today just to kind of break it up so you don't have to listen to me the whole time. So uh, that'll be great. So maybe a little bit of background on on Birchbeck Expeditions. Uh, just, you know, a quick note to let you know, you know, this whole thing was founded in 2003, so we've, we're marking our 21st year uh, since its inception in our 20th season because we didn't operate on the COVID year. But, um, you know, it is operated by the Western New York Scout Council, originally, you know, the Greater Niagara Frontier Council, and um, it is completely volunteer-led. You know, it is, um, you know, basically this crew you see here plus a few others that weren't able to make that meeting. Uh, you know, everyone on the uh, team is um, is all, are all volunteers, and we have one professional that's um, part of the Scout Council that um, helps us with some of the logistics and paying the bills and some of that that goes on at Chris Matthewson. So it's a, a great team, and I'm so thrilled to have them with all their skills and the background that they bring to the program. Uh, and they're all, as you can tell, relatively mature. There's even some gray hair mixed in there. And uh, it's because there a lot of them are, um, I don't know, semi-retired scout scouters that, that were scoutmasters or assistant scoutmasters. And so they know scouting, they know the scout values and, you know, the oath and promise, and they follow it in everything that we do. And our real goal as this group, as we, you know, we kind of kiddingly say, is uh, to put fannies in canoe seats. And what we mean by that is we want to introduce scouts to the beauty and the craft of wilderness canoe tripping. We really... Our, our goal is to is to give this experience and take this experience and share it with people so that we build life lifelong skills I think that's the way to put it and, and matter of fact my own sons uh, both have gone through this program and we still to this day go off on canoe expeditions together just as a as a family and enjoy it thoroughly so we hope to bring that to um, uh, not only high adventure experience for our scouts but you know give them these lifelong skills so why why do we do all this? Um, you know, what's the what's a little bit of the background on it? And I, I mentioned my own sons, and I I know when they were I think it was 2006, uh, we had come back from Philmont, and we were kind of trying to say well, what's next. And I was trying to keep my older son engaged with scouting, and uh, and I was looking for you know some other challenge for him, and that's when we ran into Birchbark Expeditions, and the first time I went just as a dad. Uh, and then after that, fell in love with the program, and then and next thing you know, ended up as a guide. And then uh, the founder decided to retire, and uh, um, I ended up uh, with Hank and Dave Bliss originally uh, taking on some responsibility to keep the program running. So why do we do this? It's about um, pro pro uh, providing challenges for these older scouts, right? So leadership uh, opportunities, um, setting some some difficult goals, you know, something – that's an extra challenge to give them some of the physical and mental challenges. Uh, and also, you know, frankly, putting a lot of the camping skills uh, to use. There's a lot of troops. I know our own troop, a lot of our camping was, you know, out of a trailer and we maybe carried gear, maybe, a, you know, 100 feet at the most. And we had all those camping skills. And we really wanted to put, put them to use uh, by with a high adventure ex expedition. So we think it's really, really important that every unit has some kind of high adventure program. You know, a lot of units cycle through uh, maybe a birch bark expedition, a Philmont, maybe go um, you know, to one of the other high adventure bases, maybe go down to the summit uh, or, you know, down to Florida, th these kinds of experiences to be able to keep these older scouts motivated and energized and give them leadership opportunities too. So that's, we think, why it's really, really important for every unit to have a good, solid high adventure program. But with that, of course, comes some challenges, and you know that is like, what do we do? What what kind of ideas and what kind of planning is required to do this event? What kind of special skills do I need, and what expertise? You know, uh, you know, not everybody knows all the little tips and tricks. 
Uh, what kind of specialized training do I need? What kind of uh, equipment do we need to be able to pull off this kind of expedition to do it safely and comfortably? What permits and re reservations are required? What specialized food and how do we plan a menu for a week? You know, you're basically going to be planning a, you know, a full week or, you know, or more of, of meals. Uh, and then there's all the local knowledge, like where's that freshwater spring that's between, the, uh, between Penn and, uh, and Rock Lake, you know, there, there's a great little um, freshwater uh, spring there that, that is a real treat to uh, get some fresh water from. And, you know, there's water slides between Hardy and, and Party Lake and th these kinds of things. So mixing that along with some program ideas too, like, you know, why are, you know, why is this place here? What were the Native Americans doing when they were here? Uh, why did the explorers come here? What was the value here when they came here? So those are all the kind of things that we think are valuable in putting together a high adventure program. And one of the key things is, is that we've taken most of that and bundled it and made it a, a program to make it much, much easier for scout leaders to organize a high adventure track, taking a lot of the complexity out of it and basically made a, you know, a relatively turnkey program uh, certainly, there's some training that you need to do to be ready for it, right? We all know at least you got to do some youth protection training, but there's, but there's some skills training uh, to get ready for a high adventure program and, and be able to have that. So we have uh, put together three programs that are, are part of our um, uh, a part of the uh, Birch Park Expeditions program. Uh, it starts with our Algonquin Seven Day Adventure. This is the original program that we started in 2003. And uh, that's held up in El Algonquin. And we'll be talking about some details on that. We also, um, after COVID, um, to, because of the border crossing issues, we uh, started running the, our program in, El in the Adirondacks. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about that. What are some of the differences between it and the uh, Algonquin program? And then more recently, we came up with uh, just a local program, a an opportunity to just give people a taste of what it's like to go canoeing build some canoeing skills and get to see some of the local sites and we'll cover that towards the end of today's presentation. So, so the uh, Algonquin and Adirondack program have a couple of, a few things in common. They're basically the same program, they just run in a different place and we'll, we'll cover some of the, the differences. But what they have in common is they're both seven day canoe adventures. Uh, you'll actually spend five days in the interior, or, you know, also known as the back country. And um, this is really going to be a custom design program. We're going to help you design uh, an itinerary that matches the crew's skill level. So if we've got a, a group of you know, good, strong scouts that want to uh, take on a 50, 60 mile trek, that's, that's totally okay. We'll set you up with that. But at the same time too, we've had troops and crews say, you know what, we're really not interested in a 50 miler. We just want to have a relaxing time together. We don't want to do a lot of portaging or a lot of hard work. We want to do fishing, or we want to do some hikes, or whatever it might be. So we'll we'll design a trek that's, that's, that's around your cool. um, your interests and desires. And then um, uh, also too, you know, what are some of the things that that are done? Right, mostly obviously canoeing. That's how you get around. Uh, but also hiking, fishing, camping, exploring. So some wildlife uh, photography. Uh, all those things are pretty common that um, our crews do. And they all come home with you know experiences based on what their interests are. So we always run them on e either flat, war flat water or class one, which means um, you know it's uh, maybe a slow moving creek. Um, there's no white water. There's no helmets. There's none of that. Um, that you know we're not prepared for that at this early stage with uh, your experience. Uh, and we have some real common goals that a lot of crews like to shoot for. So 50 milers are a very common one. And typically to achieve that, you need to do a, uh, a community service project before you go. That's the best way to do it. And then, of course, you have to plan your itinerary so that you cover 50 miles between the paddling and the portaging uh, during your trek. Also, the canoeing merit badge. All our guides are ready to sign off on that, uh, along with cooking and, and camping. And there's probably a dozen more that you could probably knock out if you're really uh, focused on merit badges. So... Um, and, it, you know, again, either program, we can cover those as, as goals for the, uh, for the expedition. So I'm going to cover a little bit more detail in the Algonquin adventure, and then I'll turn it over to, to Hank to talk about um, our Adirondack adventure. So 
first just start with where is Algonquin and, and why do we go up there? So Algonquin is a large provincial park uh, um, in uh, Ontario. It's uh, about four hours drive straight north of Toronto. It takes about six hours to get there f here from Buffalo. Uh, and um, it's uh, pretty common for uh, out, out of council crews to come here to Buffalo first, uh, partially because the flights are cheaper, but also they have an opportunity then to see Niagara Falls. And I know some of the crews that are uh, on this call are planning on doing that. It's a, it's a great way to get started. Uh, get get a chance to see the falls both from the U.S. side and then also from the Canadian side, uh, either on the way up or on the way back. And there's some great camping at Four Mile Creek on the U.S. side. Um, camping's a little scarcer on the Canadian side, uh, but if you decide you want to do that, we, we can we can hook you up with a couple of ideas. Um, so why do we go all the way up to Algonquin? And I usually tell people, I said, well, first of all, look at the map. You'll notice that there really only is one road that goes through Algonquin, and that tells you a little bit about how wild it is. It's very remote. Um, the vast majority of the park is miles, if not days, away from the nearest road. Uh, and with that comes quite a bit of wilderness. It's um, uh, real good opportunities to see moose. Uh, most crews will see a moose when they're up there. You may see it in the backcountry, or you may just see it in base camp, tell you the truth. Um, not uncommon to see them along the uh, Route 60 corridor, <clears throat> and is widely recognized uh, as you know world-class canoe trippings, well-documented routes. Um, it is definitely something different. If you've already done one of our Adirondack treks, uh, you know it's maybe a next good step, uh, or if you've gone to the Northern Tier, it's uh, another good opportunity to see something different. It does have a couple additional challenges because it's up in Canada. Um, probably th really three of them. One of them is, you know, the requirement of the passport, passport card, or enhanced driver's license to get into Canada, and that's true now uh, for everyone. Um, for a while, they were able to get away with just permission slips and birth certificates for the kids, but unfortunately, um, that time has passed. Uh, and, of course, there's some extra permission slips you need to deal with um, for the border crossing. Obviously, Canadians and the U.S. immigration are very concerned about, you know, tr you know children traveling without their parents. Uh, lastly, um, it's a little bit more expensive than our other program, and when we get to pricing, you'll, you'll see what the price difference is, is, and that's mostly due to the, the cost of all the permits that we have to get uh, up in Canada. So there's some great cultural activities up there. The uh, Algonquin Visitor Center is a must-see. Um, it gives you some good background on you know, the flora, the fauna, the, uh, the forestry in the park, the history of the park. They've got some good dioramas. They've got a great movie. Uh, that gives you tells you the story of the park, and also too, there's a logging museum in the park, and again, highly recommended. It's an outdoor, even though it's, there's a you start out in a little visitor center with a movie, um, then there's a walking tour, and you get a chance to walk through basically the history of logging in Algonquin. Uh, that's the one thing a lot of people don't know is Algonquin is a major source of timber uh, for the U.S. and Canada, and uh, it's very carefully managed. And um, you'll learn about that as you um, tour that museum, and you'll understand how they manage the forest and the forestry products that come out of it. So the travel itinerary um, works out with, um, we have our crews come up Saturday uh, to our base camp at Whitefish uh, Campground. It's a group campground, you know, like probably a lot of them you've already camped in, uh, with uh, uh, potable water and uh, a little bit better than porta potties but... Uh, uh, you know, latrines, <laughs> so, uh, but there is a, a camp, there is a regular campground nearby that's got showers and, and regular flush bathrooms and those kinds of things, so it's not totally in the woods. Uh, there we'll give you a, a guide prepared meal for dinner and you'll do some initial training on that Saturday. And then Sunday, um, we'll probably have you go off and do your cultural activities either in the morning or the afternoon, kind of split the crews up, and also some on-water training, do some uh, dunking of the canoes, some canoe of a canoe rescues, uh, probably work on some of the kinks in your paddling and get you ready and then have you pack everything all up so that Monday morning you're ready to put in. Uh, we take you to your, wherever your, uh, your uh, put in is uh, and send you on your way and you're in the back country then Monday through Friday uh, where we'll pick you up and then return you back to the Whitefish Campground uh, where the much coveted shower will occur over at the uh, campground. 
and then uh, you'll clean up all your crew gear, check it all back in um, for a closing uh, dinner, and then uh, and then probably a uh, dinner in town is uh, pretty common to go into town and have some hamburgers and things like that. So then Saturday um, would be the time you break camp and and head home. That's that's the typical way that that, that works. So. And you notice the photo on the right. This is uh, one of the waterfalls that you would run across of in your Algonquin. Um, and it's uh, a favorite spot because there's actually a water slide, a natural water slide that um, scouts love to ride down. And it's at the end of Pardee Lake. Uh, um, so it's good, good fun. Very common. So, Hank, why don't you step us through a little bit on the uh, Adirondack adventure? Sure. Um, so much like... Uh the Algonquin experience. Uh, it's in one of our more wilderness areas of New York state. Uh, we use our base camp out of uh, Camp Mountaineer. Any of you that are familiar with uh, the Adirondack camps up that way. It's right near uh, Tupper Lake, approximately six hours from Buffalo. Um, if you're coming in from Boston or New York, about a five and a half hour trip. And uh, we had a crew from Maryland a couple of years back, about an eight hours truck. So yeah. as you can see from the map, it's uh, to the northeastern part of uh, New York. Yep. And again, uh, we try to uh, provide students, or excuse me, our uh, scouts with all kinds of cultural opportunities. Uh, some of those might be uh, climbing one of the peaks uh, or mountain areas in the area. Uh, there's a photo from Ampersan. Uh, the Adirondack Wild Center is nearby, uh, Six Nations Indian Museum. Um, and the New York State Ranger School, uh, as well as Paul Smith's College, uh, are all areas that uh, have some forestry programs, environmental science uh, for our scouts to uh, experience. Yep. So why the Adirondacks? Uh, it is a remote wilderness. Depending on the truck that you pick, you, you, you'll be away from folks. Uh, many lakes and ponds. Um, we have experienced guides that have been through this area canoeing uh, many of us for, for decades. So uh, lots of flexibility, uh, flat water, big lakes that you can paddle around and spend an entire uh, five days just on flat water visiting campsite to campsite, or you can get to the ba deep backcountry. Uh, one of the benefits, Alan had talked about some of the challenges crossing the border. There is no border crossing. There's no need for passports. Um, and um, because of its location, it's closer to the East Coast. So that the travel time is more reasonable for a lot of, a lot of folks. So again, the travel itinerary, we ask uh, everyone to arrive at base camp, um, Camp Mountaineer. Uh, we provide the on-water training. Uh, canoe rescues, as Alan had suggested, uh, some paddling, uh, and then we'll prepare dinner, uh, oftentimes uh, doing one of our trail meals uh, to, to a demonstration with our scouts uh, and leaders as well. Uh, we encourage folks to uh, do some additional uh, on-water training or perhaps uh, travel into town to visit one of the cultural centers. Then again, Monday through Friday, we're out in the back country, uh, come back in on Friday, um, getting our gear cleaned up, grabbing dinner in town, getting a nice fresh shower. And uh, one of the things that we strongly encourage is everyone stay the night on Friday. Uh, many of us want to get home. We want to get to our loved ones. We want to sleep in our own bed, all those things. But we tend to be exhausted and very, very tired. And um, the number one re uh, accidents that happen in scouting are during the travel time. So we want you to stay up there, enjoy, decompress. And th there is a process of um, disengaging from society on these treks and then having to re-engage and doing that slowly is really a wise thing to do. Yeah, I should note too, this uh, photo here on the right is uh, Dave Bliss um, presenting to, um, I think it's Troop 1485 from, from the Baltimore, Maryland area, an all-girl troop that had never canoed before. So there was a lot of, you know, getting started instruction but you know the ladies uh, all went on a great trek. They had a wonderful time, and uh, it also answers one of the questions that comes up a lot of times, which is, you know, is our program co-ed? It's like absolutely, our program is co-ed. We have crews all the time that are mixed genders, and also, you know, all female crews that go out occasionally too. So, um, totally open to uh, both boys and girls. All right. So next, I uh, wanted to share a little video um, with you and. Uh, um, this will give you a little taste of, of what Birchbark is like. It's uh, just a quick little 30-second video, 
and uh, hopefully the sound will come out for you and uh, uh, enjoy real quick because it'll give you a little taste of it. Um, let's see, before we go on, I just want to see if there's any questions here. So real quick, I can see, you know, Steve is asking um, about, um, you know, sharing the PowerPoint. Absolutely. When we get done with this, we'll send an email out. We'll send a link to the PowerPoint if you want to download it. And you can you can share this presentation with your your group. And I also, um, someone's been taking photos of each of the slides. We're, we're recording this. So we'll also send you a link to the full recording. So if you just want to share it with your troop, you, you could uh, do a couple things. You could just uh, share the recording with your group. Or you could schedule uh, a time when uh, either Hank or I could stop in on a Zoom call, a dedicated Zoom call to present to your troop. And we'd be happy then to not only go through the material that you're interested in, but also we can answer specialized questions that go along with it. All right. <clears throat> so, yeah, Mark's asking, uh, do we have dates for the 2025 summer? Um, while we have not set the heart dates, I will tell you that the algorithm we use to choose the dates that we start is we start after the 4th of July. We start the first Saturday after the 4th of July, unless the 4th of July is like on a Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, then we bump it to the week later. So this year we're starting on July 13th so that we don't get too close to July 4th, um, you know, for obvious reasons, right? A lot of people go on family vacations over the 4th of July weekend and we don't want to bugger that up. All right, so let's talk about some of the program requirements, like you know who's eligible to go and what does it take to go to either of the two um, backcountry high adventure tracks. Well, that starts with um, being, first of all, a registered scout and or scouter. Right? You know now with the BSA, anyone who goes on an overnight track has to be a registered scout or scouter, uh, so they have to be part of the BSA and be a member. Uh, for this particular program, they have to be 13 uh, years or older by September 1st of the year that you're going. So technically someone could be 12 years old, but as long as their birthday is either during the trek or the next month after, it's fine. Uh, they have to have passed the blue swimmer test in the last 12 months. So, you know, you could do a March swim test if you wanted to uh, at your local council. Um, you don't have to do it with us. You don't have to, you know, come prepared to do a swim test. As a matter of fact, we don't want to do swim tests up there. We got a lot of other material to cover and don't want to spend any time uh, doing swim tests. Mm -hmm. uh, also, too, um, the, uh, you, you have to complete and submit uh, a BSA health form, and that's all, the, all four parts. Um, you know, the health form now has a medical attestation at the end of it, right? We do a physical, and then your doctor signs off on your participation. And we'll, we'll get into some of those materials we get through a little bit later. Um, and also, be, be a good physical health, right? It's... Um, these trucks are not super hard, but they're not easy either. And um, depending on the truck that you choose, or your scouts choose, is probably more appropriately worded. Um, you know, there's some, there could be some doozies of uh, portages and carrying a 68-pound canoe uh, is physically challenging. So um, uh, you need to be in good health. And with uh, within the BSA height and weight restrictions, and that's on the health form, uh, you know, with a BMI score. Uh, within that and again, you know, get your doctor to sign off on it. And we do recommend that the scouts are at least first class. They've gone on a few campouts, they've cooked some meals, they got some basic camping skills. It's not absolutely required, but it's recommended. Um, you know, you don't want your first camp out to be 30 miles away from the nearest road and have somebody have a meltdown uh, missing home. So, <laughs> so. Uh, and then actually, a good question here. Uh, Mark asked, so, you know, what about. Um, what if they're 17 or 18? Yeah, that, that's fine. If they're 18, they'll just register as an adult. Uh, that, that's totally fine. We have um, crews go that are mixes of uh, um, you know, youth, which is under 18 and over 18. That's, that's not a problem. And we, matter of fact, we need adults, right? Anyhow, so that's fine. All right, what does a crew typically look like? Look like? Um, 
No, the ideal crew, and again, this can vary, the ideal crew would have six youth, two adults, plus your guide, that makes nine people total. And why do we do nine? Um, because that puts three people in each of our, our three tripping canoes. You know, and you'll see, you'll, hopefully you saw in that video, you know, we use their 17 foot long tripping canoes. It's not like your regular canoe that would be at your scout camp. You know, they're bigger, they're designed to carry heavy weights to deal with high wind and big waves. Uh, and by having two scouts plus an adult in each boat, um, you can move along pretty quickly and you can cover your 10 or 12 miles during the, during, for the day uh, in the first half of the day. So um, that's typically why we do it. There are, um, the nine-person limit is a hard limit within, within Algonquin, uh, and there is some flexibility for that in the Adirondacks. There are certain areas and parts of the Adirondacks where you can canoe or camp with more than nine people. And probably the question comes up, well, what, if, what if I've got 15 people that are interested in going? Well, you would make two crews. You know, one, one crew would be, let's say, you know, you're eight, eight and then you would split the other one up with a, with a remainder. So um, it's a way to mix and match the crews. It's a little note on the picture on the right, that is uh, Troop 35 from Medina, and they joined us. That is an Algonquin that's on an island in Porcupine Lake uh, up in... Uh, and let's see, it's the southern part of Algonquin. So it's a typical sort of campsite and what they look like. It's just basically a fire pit, a couple of logs maybe to sit on. Uh, um, it's usually a pretty relaxing little spot. So what are our dates for this year? Um, like I said, we're, we're um, going to Algonquin the first two weeks, July 13th to 20th, and then 20th to the 27th we'll be in Algonquin. And then we pack everything all up. And we head down to the Adirondacks, and um, we're probably going to have to we'll rewire this a little bit to leave a day in between um, if we move to the Adirondacks. But anyway, the idea is to start on the 27th in the Adirondacks, go to the August 3rd, and then go from August 3rd to 10th in the Adirondacks. So those are the four weeks, and they're you know numbered weeks, one through four. And right now, Algonquin is, uh, we have availability for at least one crew. On week one and two, week three is pretty open, and week four is almost filled. That's I think we have maybe just one more slot on week four. So there's still a little bit of availability in there, but um, we're getting sign-ups most every week here. All right, training. So, Hank, I'm going to let you talk to them a little bit about some of the training sessions that we've got. Yeah, I think it, it's important to note that um, – you're not left alone. You don't show up, jump in your canoe and head off to the back country. We want to make sure that we've designed a boy led uh, experience uh, that everyone's prepared for. So we'll bring the advisor together uh, as well as uh, your crew leader, if you choose, uh, on March 18th. And uh, we'll do that both in person and via Zoom to kind of uh, give a little bit more detailed information, hand out some uh, program materials uh, to each of the crews. Uh, we then circle back about a month later. Uh, and again, we bring along your uh, navigator and the advisors and your crew leader. And the crew leader is your scout. Um, we want to be finalizing your trek, uh, making sure we've finalized your meal choices, the whole nine yards as you come through uh, into that second session. And then what we do is we have an a all-day experience uh, it's, uh, referred to as a shakedown on June 8th in which you come in and we spend uh, about seven hours together uh, learning all of the skills that you're going to be ne needing to uh, use. We get you on the water for several hours to help learn the paddle, the paddle the uh, canoes appropriately here, the different strokes, the safety features, uh, learn how to throw your uh, bear bag ropes. Uh, how do you use a filter? How do you portage uh, effectively and uh, collectively with your crew? Um, all of those skills. We don't want you having a first time experience when you um, end up in an Algonquin or the Adirondacks. We'll refresh these things at base camp, uh, but we want to make sure that you're fully prepared as we move into uh, your trek. And of course, people out of council um, will say, well, gee whiz, how, you know, how do we make it up to our camp scout haven? Well, what we'll, we do for you is we pack up uh, the material kit that we use w with our guides to do a shakedown, and we'll send that material off to you, and then you can organize your own shakedown. Um, if you're in the Albany area, roughly in that neighborhood, or in the Boston area, we've got people uh, that are trained that can handle that for you. 
uh, and and come in and you know walk you through some of the procedures and and all that to help you with your shakedown. So we've um, we've got some people that can stop in and help you with that. So maybe just talk a little bit about some of the training materials we provide. So um, each uh, crew will be receiving a series of books. You can see these on the website. You can link and um, take a look at those. We provide a step-by-step -step guide for each of the advisors. It outlines all the, the skills that you want to practice prior to getting on the water, checklists, materials, and so forth. Um, there's a, every, Each crew will receive uh, paddler's maps, either for the Adirondacks or for Algonquin, so that you'll actually have waterproof maps that you can take a look at to uh, prepare for your trip. And um, there's a guidebook that'll share with you some of the, the detailed treks, whether they're uh, whether an easy, a moderate, or a more adventurous type uh, trek that, to help you um, work with your crew leader and your crew to determine the best uh, trek for each of them. Of course, the, depending on where you go, you get a different packet. And uh, as we noted, you know the materials that we've written are available on a resource page on the um, particular program uh, landing page. So if you go to the Algonquin page and look up at the top, you'll see the word resources. You can click on that. It'll take you to a page where you can, you can take a peek at these uh, materials. Some of them are password protected, and the password for them is the word Algonquin with a capital A. So... There you go. You got your secret for the day. All right, let's talk about pricing. Um, for this year, our Algonquin program is priced at five forty-five per person, and our Adirondack program is uh, a little bit less expensive at four ninety-five per person. And um, there is a slight upcharge for real small crews if you've only got you know a couple of kids and a few adults. Um, we could still do it, but um, we have to do a little upcharge as you know some of the. Some of the materials and, and, and content is, uh, you know, we have to cover the costs of those, irrespective of crew size. Um, to get started, um, we asked the crews to submit a $400 deposit, and we've um, gotten that from most of the crews so far. There's only a couple that still owe us a deposit. Uh, and for the local in-council crews, there's some, potentially some camper ships. It'll depend on the year whether or not there's money available for that. We don't know that quite yet for this upcoming year. Uh, but also, if you check with your own council, uh, for the out of council folks, you may want to just check real quick, see if there's camperships available for, for high adventure programs. And we break the payment up into a, a few different small steps. Um, we try to get uh, uh, that deposit upon reservation, and then uh, we ask that you know the first third um, is is put in by uh, on or around February first, uh, second third around April 1st, but everything has to be paid fully uh, by June 1st. That's, uh, that is the one hard hard date. We've got to get that all in. Uh, you know, somewhere along in there we're buying food and we're preparing materials and putting permit requests in and some of those things. So uh, getting your money on time is important to us. And how that happens is through our website. We, uh, um, are, we use a platform called Double Knot to do our registrations. Uh, and uh, um, it starts with just doing a crew reservation request, which I think most of you crews that are on the call have already submitted one. But um, from then, then we'll send you a link to a, a week-specific payment uh, page that then you um, you create a, uh, a detailed roster, and you can start to load your roster information, your crew information to make payments on that. And that's all you know based on your account on our double knot system as you go. And um, you know, one of the questions that pop up is, well, I don't know exactly for sure exactly who's going. That's okay. Just get who you know is going in, and then when you get closer, then you can just add the last person or two, or maybe swap somebody else. Got to go to a summer school. Somebody else can go instead, or some combination like that. Okay, so you got some flexibility on that on that front. Uh, and yeah, as I note here, the payments are made by crew. It's uh, not done individually, it's done by crew. And that way, uh, there's one account for each crew. So with your, um, with your participation, there's a few souvenirs. Well, one of the things is a coveted Birch Bark Expeditions patch, which I've got one on here, but you can't quite see it because it's cut off by the camera. Uh, also, a, a water bottle and T-shirt, a souvenir, a logoed water bottle and T-shirt come with your uh, experience. And if you are so brave as to go up to Algonquin, and if you're brave enough to bushwhack your way back into Baden-Powell Lake and, and visit the Carn, 
uh, on Baden-Powell Lake, you can also get one of these uh, special patches, uh, the Baden-Powell patch. So uh, maybe that's a little incentive to try something ab above and beyond. So what's included with the, with the program? Well, we just talked about the souvenirs, uh, but we provide all the in-camp food, and backcountry food. Uh, the only one we don't provide, um, so that last day, that last Friday night, we'll give you a dehydrated meal that you can, you can prepare and cook in camp, but uh, frankly, a lot of crews are, at that point, they're itching to go into town or they're already in town, right, because they went to, let's say, the Wild Center in the Adirondacks, so they've already gone through Tupper Lake or up in Algonquin, you can go uh, east out of the park and go to Whitney, which um, there's a couple of joints in there. There's a hamburger joint called the Mad Musher, uh, and there's also a pizza parlor in Whitney, and a lot of crews like to go into town to get um, some nice greasy hamburgers. But all the rest of the meals we, we provide, we provide the uh, meals when you arrive in base camp, uh, after you, know, you have to have your lunch when you arrive, but um, we pick up their dinner and um, all the backcountry food. We cover all the permits and parking fees, which uh, is no small amount, by the way, in Algonquin. Uh, we, um, all the equipment that you're going to use, the crew gear, which we'll cover here in a second. Uh, we'll do all this pre-trek training and all the materials that we're going to send you. Um, we're going to have a guide. You're going to have access to a guide. Basically, from when you sign up, we'll uh, we'll give you a guide that can work with you in training your your crew, um, all the way through to uh, when you uh, jump in the car and head out. So you'll have somebody with you the whole time, and of course, you'll go home with a whole host of memories and skills and pictures, hopefully, and maybe a couple of fish. So uh, lots to lots to do and lots to see. And this moose we caught uh, this picture from. Uh, our canoe, and I think it was in, I think it was Longer Lake is where this was caught. This uh, photo was taken. So uh, what's the crew gear like? So we have uh, um, now a fresh set of Eureka Timberline tents or some new Kel Kelty tents. You know, with the new BSA camping requirements, so basically now we're down to two-man tents uh, to keep people, you know, age appropriate together. Um, we give you a 12 by 12 dining fly, rain fly to use uh, in base camp to get your gear dry, and if it's raining to keep, you know, you can cook meals out, out of the rain. Um, what are called Duluth packs, big line, giant uh, knapsacks to carry all this gear in uh, that are used in canoe tripping. They fit in the bottom of the canoe, and they're um, great to carry things on the portages. Uh, we'll give you all the cooking and cleaning equipment that you would need, uh, something called Kelly kettles, which is a way of, um, of getting water boiling. So you get done with this, you can Google what's a Kelly kettle, and you'll see that. Um, depending if there's a, a lot of rain or if there's a bur uh, fire um, ban, we also uh, provide you butane stoves that'll help uh, with, uh, you know, quick getting some water boiling for the morning coffee. Uh, you know, the canoes, uh, we've got two different types of canoes. We've got uh, Old Town Penobscots, which are really solid tripping canoes, and Winona um, Spirits, and the... Uh, uh, both of those are Roilex canoes, and they're tough as nails, and they can deal with the stuff that scouts can throw at them. And depending on the canoe, they weigh either 65 or 68 pounds. So all the paddles, PFDs, water purification system, everything to hang bear bags every night, uh, saw, um, and a bunch of other gear. But um, we also send you out with a, our guide will have a satellite communicator and can do text messaging to and from uh, friends and family, and also there's an SOS button on those those in-reach devices so we can uh, get help if there's an emergency, which thank God we've only had to use once, and we've used it accidentally once, so we know it works. All right, personal equipment. In the materials we're going to send you is a list of the personal equipment. It's also on that resource page. If you go to that page, you'll see uh, the list of personal equipment. Uh, there's a PDF you can download. And, um, but basically, it's if you've been camping with, sc with scouts, you've got the majority of it already. You probably, um, you know, have got a headlamp and you've probably got, you know, um, you know, camping soap containers and stuff like that. So you should be set. Probably the only thing you really have to worry about is dry bags. Dry bags um, is probably new for most people. You can either buy one 20 liter dry bag. And that'll, that'll keep both, uh, you know, your sleeping gear and your sleeping bag dry. Or like I do, I use two smaller ones, two 10 liters. And that's uh, my son's gear actually there. And he brought along a Frisbee for something to play with and, you know, his camera and some other stuff like that. So that's typically w what a personal gear looks like. You don't take much with you in the, in the backcountry. 
a lot of people say, well, gee whiz, that's a lot to be, um, you know, for a week. And it's like, well, remember, you're going to be basically car camping the first couple of nights in base camp. So you're going to have, you know, clothes and gear for that. And then there's the backcountry gear. And then when you come back to base camp, then you switch back to your, you know, car camping gear. So um, when you see the list, hopefully it'll make more sense. But um, just to give you an idea, that's about all you take into the backcountry, which is basically one change of clothes, maybe a polar fleece. Uh, your sleeping bag, and um, that's about it. All right, so that's the two big programs. Um, if there's any other questions, let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, question here about um, adults and uh, how many per tent. So, yeah, generally the adults would do two per tent, um, you know, unless they're, un, I don't know, unrelated, don't, whatever, and you decide for whatever reason, want to bring another tent. But I would highly recommend if you're going to do a solo tent that you bring a solo tent um, or a hammock or something like that, because um, you know space and weight is just as you know important on a on a canoe trek because of the portages as you would in a backpacking trek. You don't want to bring extra tents just for the fun of it. We uh, uh, encourage you to minimize the amount of stuff that you bring because. Uh, um, you know, a 1.5 mile portage gets real long when you're carrying extra gear that you don't really need. Um, anyway, okay, so let's move on and let's talk about the, the local expeditions in our what we call Western New York Adventure Program. So the, the, maybe a little bit of history on this um, before we go. So um, what we were talking to units as we've been kind of presenting our, you know, our the two bigger programs, which we just covered, and to units in, in our local council here. And a lot of times we got, oh, geez, you know, our scouts have barely even put a canoe in the water. I don't know. That's a little bit much for them. Um, so we said, you know what, let's come up with a program where you can take you out for, you know, a day paddle, um, get you, a ch you know, a chance to experience some of the local waterways. So we created this Western New York Adventure Program. Uh, to you know, to explore the uh, waterways in our area, and we mostly do one-day treks just to put in some place, um, and we'll, I'll show you some pictures of some ideal spots. It's just a great way to experience canoeing for a couple of hours, teach you some paddling, make you feel comfortable in the canoe again, uh, maybe work some kinks out of your paddling skills, um, get to see some things you haven't seen, like you know, what's it like to go down the Buffalo River, go out into the harbor, or maybe go out in the outer harbor, or maybe. Go down uh, Oak Orchard Creek, which is a great, great paddle. It's one of my favorites in the area. Um, we provide everything you need to do it, the canoes and the paddles and the safety gear and, and everything that goes with it. We'll send you out with a guide. We'll spend the day with you. And we have a very nominal fee of $15 per person uh, per day to, uh, to participate in this. So it's, it's a great chance to uh, experience canoeing. Uh, and get to use um, some great canoes that somebody donated to us, by the way, too. So they're brand spanking new Mad River canoes. So they're they're real sharp, real easy to paddle. And so anyway, so, you know, who can participate? Again, same sort of thing. You have to be a registered scouter, scouter. You know, somebody said, well, what if, I, you know, my wife wants to tag along in her own ca uh, kayak? Well, that's fine. They can tag along with us. Um, but, uh, you know, for to be under our charge, you got to be a registered scouter, scouter. And we, you know, again, the same thing with a swim test, and uh, uh, the adults have to have youth protection training. Uh, you're not doing an overnighter, but um, you know, we still like to have that youth protection training, uh, and of course, follow the BSA 2 deep leadership. <laughs> this is a picture of, let's see, oh yeah, Troop two, 229, Chris's troop. Um, this is actually just after the pandemic when we were all masking up, um, and they went down the Buffalo River. And they went out to the uh, outer harbor. They had, the day was nice and calm so that the lake wasn't angry, and they got a chance to get out to the outer harbor and uh, paddle out to see the lighthouse and some of the other sites out by the, the uh, Coast Guard base. So uh, um, Bob O'Connor gave us this quote, Scouts had a great experience, saw Buffalo from a whole new perspective. The guys were really well prepared and knowledgeable, and um, so I'm glad we were able to help them. So where else can you go in the uh, Western New York area? We've got um, quite a few places. Basically, Please. we just want to keep it within a four-hour trek, um, and you know, flat water again, less than Class Two moving water. And the uh, top up there by Medina, that's the Oak Orchard. And then there's the Ellicott Creek. There's the Tonawanda 
canal uh, complex that's a lot of fun. Uh, Buffalo River, 18 Mile Creek, um, Clear Lake down in uh, Sardinia. Is that North Collins or Collins? The Genesee River down towards uh, Caniadia or Belfast is a great trek. And then there's a couple different spots we can take you down the Allegheny River that are a lot of fun, either above the reservoir or down below the reservoir. There's some great paddling. So it's good fun. And then again, same thing, how to get started. If you go to our website, uh, w, uh, uh, westernyorkscouting.org slash birchbark, you'll see uh, we got a dedicated information page there. And uh, you can request either um, a paddling there or if you'd like to have us come do a presentation of your troop, we'd be happy to. We love it. It's always good fun. So with that, just kind of kind of open it up to uh, more information and where do you find more content. So if you if you've got a question, now would be a great time to drop it in the chat window. And uh, we can maybe open up the microphones and let people ask their questions too. So if you've got a question, you can just say, i got a question, or put a question mark in the chat window, and we'll go from there. So and while we're doing that, again, there's a lot on that website. Um, the program overviews, there's um, in the resource pages, you can find more videos. There's some longer videos of full tracks on our YouTube channel. <clears throat> and there's a link to that in our on our resource page. Uh, there's a form to request a, a, a unit presentation. And again, we can do that either over Zoom or come out to your to your troop. Uh, and it's also where you start a reservation request and you can download all the brochures that you can print out on your own and give out to your unit uh, or the unit's parents who might want to see a flyer or brochure. Or if you'd like, um, you can just let us know and we'll have some printed up and mailed off to you for out of council crews. And it's a great way to kind of get um, parents energized so that it answers a lot of their questions in our flyers and brochures. So, all right, any other questions? Kind of a quiet crew here. Hammocks, great question. Yes, uh, we highly encourage hammocks. Hammocks are great because there's lots of trees. It doesn't matter with the Adirondacks or Algonquin, there's plenty of trees. The only time it's a little tough, I have to admit, is in base camp in Algonquin. Um, there aren't, that is a, a group campground and there aren't enough trees for everybody to have a hammock. So we may give you a tent to uh, camp out of when you're in base camp in Algonquin, but our, our base camp in, in the Adirondacks, there's plenty of trees. There's plenty of trees in the interior of the back country and hammocking is a great way to do it. The only thing we kind of say is please let it not be your first night in a hammock. You know, uh, do a couple of shakedown hangs, as they say, and uh, that'd be great. Um, so yeah, Mark asked the question, um, do we have, you know, we have more than six kids and uh, bring two crews, how does that work? Yeah, good question. Um, so a couple ways to do it. One of them is you create sister crews and that's where the two crews would go on basically the same itinerary. Uh, we do separate you um, because that creates more leadership opportunities. If, you know, again, if you had 12 youth and four adults, that would be great. But if you don't have that, still we'll kind of divide you up and we'd ask you to divide yourself up on your own into two crews, like an A crew and a B crew, or maybe, you know, the, the Falcons and the Eagles or something like that. Break them up into crews. And then that gives, you know, more opportunities to have a crew leader and a navigator, um, you know, a quartermaster, all those kind of crew positions. Uh, there'll be one of those at each of the crews, and that um, that kind of breaks them up. So anyway, that's with sister crews. Um, there's also the concept of just taking them, splitting the scouts up on, based on what trek they want to go on. Some scouts just want to go on an easy zero portage trek, maybe do a couple of side hikes, see a fire tower or something like that. That's fine. We can arrange that. Uh, but all, the other crew might want to do something more challenging. They might want to do, a, you know, a 50 miler, or maybe something, you know, more challenging than just paddling around the same lake for a week. Um, and we can divide them up that way. Um, some crews have done, or double crews have done the same itinerary, but done it in the opposite directions. So they passed each other on Wednesday. That's worked out pretty well. So they, you know, say we're going to meet you on this island on Wednesday. And then uh, they, you know, they camp on the, you know, there's two campsites on the island. They camp uh, on that island and then uh, have some fun together. And then the next day they part ways and go their own way. So a couple different options. Um, any one of those works. Um, we do like to 
split them up. I kind of recommend it. Um, when you get six canoes trying to hit a portage all at the same time, it gets a little hectic and canoe packs get mixed up and paddles get left and forgotten. And it gets a little messed up. So we, uh, we do try to at least separate. If two crews are on the same truck, we say, you know, hey, why don't, you know, you get a half an hour head start and, and we'll, we'll come in behind you. Um, and that way we're not all fighting over the same portages at the same time. So yeah, that was a good question, and uh, ha happy to share on that. So any other questions? That would be a great time. So one of the questions I'm surprised hasn't popped up, which is, well, what, what are the mosquitoes like? That's a famous one. <laughs> so part of the reason we go in late July and August is because um, it's it's the least mosquitoey in both the uh, Algonquin and the Adirondacks. Uh, if it's been if it's been a fairly dry spring or summer. Uh, the mosquitoes are not a problem at all. You might run into a couple of them uh, before you go to bed. They're not bad at all. Um, the other places you run into them, and some of the portages, if it's the portage goes through a swampy or wet area, you might run into mosquitoes. But what we do is we actually, as part of the training, we'll teach you, we'll t talk to you about uh, permethrin, which is a, a, a spray that you put on your clothes before you pack to come on the trek. Uh, it's available at Dick's Sporting Goods, uh, at least all over here in in New York State, I've seen it, and you spray it on your clothes um, before you uh, pack up, a couple, you know, like a week or so beforehand. And that, um, what that does is it uh, it makes your clothes mosquito resistant. And then we also suggest bringing a, a mosquito net, uh, head net. And between those two things, you really don't have problems with it. Maybe a couple of drops of DEET on your wrists or something like that around your neck, and that'll just keep the bugs at bay and usually pretty good so okay so that's one question any others <clears throat> and then the last question I'll uh, bring up that always comes up is what are the bathrooms like <laughs> so so in our two base camps like I said at our base camp in uh, Algonquin it's uh, a pit toilet not unlike a lot of scout camps pretty similar to that um, or if you've been to Philmont, you know what a Red Roof Inn is like, that kind of uh, facility. Uh, it's not nice, but it works. Our base camp in uh, the Adirondacks is, has flushable toilets and showers. So that is a much more refined experience, let's put it that way. Um, so that kind of answers that. But in the back country, uh, all of them, whether it's Algonquin or the Adirondacks, it's basically, it's a wooden box that's quite a ways back in the, uh, away from the campsite, and it usually has a lid on it, and uh, it's got a hole in it. <laughs> so there's no walls, uh, and if we have a co-ed crew, we'll uh, bring some extra tarps to create a little bit of privacy. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's true rural uh backcountry experience. We wouldn't want to miss that. So anyway, question about emergencies. Um, yeah, great question, Brendan. Thanks for asking that. Um, so again, it depends on where we are, but we, uh, our experience with uh, um, the uh, inReach devices has been really, really good. If we truly do have a severe injury and we need to evacuate somebody quickly, um, what we've learned from that is uh, by pressing that button, you usually have to confirm it through the device. They They'll send you a message back within a, a couple of minutes that says, you know, what's your emergency and, and provide some details. Uh, and of course, with those messages goes your longitude and latitude to the uh, uh, control center, which is um, actually um, managed by Garmin and uh, an emergency response facility down in Dallas. And they, based on your longitude and latitude, know what the um, uh, resources are that are available and for example up in Ontario it's the uh, uh, Ontario Provincial Police that coordinated the park rangers up there the Adirondacks of course it's the DEC and their their staff and they'll either paddle fly hike motor whatever it takes to get to you whichever way is the fastest most direct way and based on the injury you know if something's truly life threatening it'll be more likely to be airborne um, if it's a bad burn or something like that, that we can manage for a few hours and use our wilderness first aid training, 
uh, that hopefully you all, adults, uh, all will have by the time you go. Um, you'll know how to treat and stabilize somebody um, so they could be canoed out or, or uh, littered out, that kind of thing. And I think it's important to note also, Ellen, that um, we are all trained in um, advanced uh, wilderness first aid, CPR. Yep. Uh, we go through uh, training every two years on this with, as guides, and we uh, do our practicums with real-life scenarios that might take place in the outdoors. So you'll have um, highly skilled people with you as well. Yep, that's a good point. That's a good point. Good. Uh, yeah, so question about sleeping bag from Brendan, too. Um, so uh, first of all, you're going in July and August, so I just want to talk temperature first and material. In July and August, you don't need a zero degree sleeping bag. We really would like to squeeze it down as best as you can. And your sleeping bag should squish down to something that's about the size of a loaf of bread, maybe smaller than a volleyball. Um, and in its dry bag with compression straps on it, you should be able to squeeze it down pretty good. Space is at utmost importance. And when we talk about how we pack those canoe packs, you'll understand uh, how important space really is. Um, I do it in two separate bags, and I'll tell you the, the reason why is um, then that makes sure that if one of the bags leaks, not everything I own is wet. <laughs> Only half my stuff is wet. Uh, and um, that's part of the reason I do it. It also gives me some more flexibility in how I pack the canoe pack. Uh, you know, by having two smaller packs, you can kind of squeeze them in nooks and crannies and stuff like that. Uh, and, yeah, the other pack, you know, what are you bringing? You're basically bringing a change of clothes. Um, you don't need three, four changes of clothes. You just need one. You need a bathing suit. You need maybe something to sleep in. You might bring a set of shorts and a t-shirt just to sleep in that hasn't been exposed to the, you know, food and things like that. So it's, it's bear proof and, uh, not, you know, not a smellable, um, you bring, you know, some plastic bags and we teach you all these skills that, to do laundry. So probably wear your first set of clothes all day Monday, all day Tuesday, and maybe Wednesday you'll do laundry, and that'll be washing that first set of clothes, and you'll switch into your second set. And then that laundry will dry by Friday morning, and then Friday you'll probably switch back into your first clothes uh, for when you come back uh, so that uh, you're relatively clean when you get back to base camp. And, uh, and then we give you your, your souvenir T-shirt, and then you're extra clean after you take your shower. So... Hopefully that answers that question. All right, any other questions? Oh, you've been good with the questions, so great. So also, too, on our website, I want to point out, too, we have an FAQ page, and um, you might want to just scroll through that. We answer a lot of the other questions that pop up, uh, uh, typically in these kinds of sessions. So it's a great way of kind of reviewing all that. And with that, I'm going to say thank you for joining us. Um, Hank and I really appreciate you um, spending some time with us. And uh, I see a last minute question here about uh, border crossing with, uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so we um, have been told in no uncertain certain circumstances by the uh, Canadian immigration people that uh, the just good old fashioned permission slip and birth certificate are not enough anymore. Um, you need to have a passport, a passport card. A passport card for a youth, like a 16 year old youth, I think is, $85, $35, $35. Um, you still have to, you know, provide a birth certificate and some of the other supporting materials to send it in, and then you can get a, a passport card. And the passport card works for the for the Canadian and Mexican border, um, but, it, you know, that will not work for if you decide you want to, you know, go to Europe or something like that or the uh, Mediterranean or Caribbean or something like that. Those places still require a full-blown passport. So hopefully that answers that question. Good. Now Dana, hopefully ask, answer that with that question. If not, you want to uh, unmute and you can ask your question if you like. Good. Okay. All right. So let's call it a wrap. Thanks again for sp spending an hour with us. We're excited to have you along and uh, look forward to seeing you. Uh, at some of our training sessions and, and seeing it on the water. So have a great night and uh, see you soon.